28 of the House Common Standing Committee on Finance. Pursuant to the order of reference of March 8, 2021, the committee is meeting to study Bill C-14, an act to implement certain provisions of the economic statement tabled in Parliament on November 30th, 2020, and other measures. Today's meeting is taking place in the hybrid format pursuant to the House Order January 25th, 2021, and therefore members are attending in person in the room and remotely using the Zoom application. The proceedings will be made available via the House of Commons website, and so that you are aware, the website webcast will always show the person speaking rather than the entirety of the committee. So uh, welcome to our witnesses uh, under this uh, under this new format. Uh, we have three witnesses uh, in the first hour panel, and we'll start uh, with uh, Mr. McDonald with the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives. And uh, Mr. McDonald, if you could hold your remarks pretty close to five minutes, we're tight in time. Go ahead, floor is yours. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Mr. Easter. I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, thanks so much uh, to the committee for the invitation today. Uh, certainly, the economic response to COVID-19 uh, from the government has been unprecedented in Canadian history. We need to look back at world wars to see government expenditures on this scale, although we'd also have to look back to the 1930s, almost a century, to see unemployment at this scale, particularly in the early months. My recent report, Picking Up the Tab, uh, was a comprehensive data set of all 850 direct federal and provincial COVID-19 measures through the end of December 2020, including the fall fiscal update. The overall conclusion of this compilation is that when it comes to measures to combat COVID-19, uh, this has been almost entirely paid for by the federal government. 92% of every dollar uh, spent on measures to combat the coronavirus on everything from purchase of PPE to business and individual supports has come from the federal government. Even in areas of provincial jurisdiction, like healthcare, 88% of the cost was borne by the federal government. The largest expenditure, uh, including both federal and provincial programs, uh, has been in support of businesses, uh, amounting to uh, $4,100 a person. Supporting individuals comes in a close second at $3,900 per capita, and healthcare support is in a distant third at uh, $1,200 a person. In each of the categories examined, except one, federal support was larger than provincial support. The one area where the provinces are spending more is on physical infrastructure to stimulate growth. This is being driven particularly by the Western provinces. Uh, the federal government's major infrastructure program at this point is the resilience stream of the Canada infrastructure program, although this only reallocates existing funds and doesn't spend new funds. It's worth pointing out that the federal government uh, in embarkation on a new round of uh, upcoming spending in the spring budget um, that in the last round of spending uh, many of the provinces didn't properly match federal spending in support of municipal deficits and many provinces didn't fully access the federal money available to them in the next phase of the recovery the federal government should keep a close eye on matching dollars and fund utilization to ensure the maximum impact for its expenditures this brings me to the next stage of federal COVID-19 spending, uh, which has been promised at 70 to $100 billion in the upcoming spring budget. As I mentioned, infrastructure spending is already budgeted in several Western provincial budgets. Uh, and this is certainly an area where the federal government can back provincial efforts like it did in the Safe Restart Agreements. New infrastructure spending that reduces the country's carbon footprint can be an important opportunity to build back better and further encourage central and Atlantic provinces to devote more of their COVID-19 dollars to infrastructure. I'd also like to take a moment to call members' attention to our annual child care fee survey published just this morning. It provides a detailed look at child care fees and COVID-19 impact in 37 Canadian cities. This year's survey shows a very concerning decline in enrollment in child care due to COVID-19 at the same time as fees remain high across much of the cities in the country. The decline in enrollment is worse in cities with high fees and worse in cities with high unemployment. And without immediate consideration, site closure and or the loss of staff may make a rapid recovery in the summer and fall impossible as parents can't find spaces for their kids as they hopefully go back to work. One of the other ongoing lessons of the child care fee survey that may be, instruction, may be instructive for, for future uh, federal efforts is that the lowest child care fees are always found in cities where providers receive provincial operational grants and then charge a low set fee. Just last year, Newfoundland 
became the fourth province to join Quebec, Manitoba, and Prince Edward Island in this approach, and it looks like the Yukon will soon follow suit. More broadly, I'm encouraged that the federal government is committed to rebuilding the economy rather than being overly preoccupied by federal deficits. Large federal deficits were necessary to avoid much worse deficits in other sectors. Had the federal government not covered expenses as it had, those deficits would have occurred elsewhere in the economy, particularly in the provinces as they covered health care costs, for individuals as they lost jobs and weren't covered by EI, or for businesses as public health measures wiped out incomes while expenses remained. A deficit is neither good nor bad on its own. It is merely one side of an accounting relationship with an equally sized surplus created in another sector. Every dollar comes from somewhere and goes to somewhere. To evaluate the utility of a deficit in a particular sector, say the federal government sector, we have to track where the surplus was created, the other side of that accounting relationship. For the past four quarters, uh, the federal deficit of $220 billion has created a surplus of the equal amount, three quarters of which has ended up in the household sector, one quarter of which has ended up in the business sector. Thankfully, little of the surplus has escaped Canada in the form of financial flows to non-residents. The federal government isn't constrained by deficits or debt to GDP ratios. It is constrained by the country's productive capacity. As long as we have people who can't find jobs, empty stores and restaurants, we aren't at our productive capacity. Inflation is the constraint the federal government faces. And we have to remember that going into this crisis, we managed historically low unemployment, rock bottom interest rates, and we still weren't seeing sustained inflation. When we've got 800,000 low wage workers still out of a job compared to February last year, we are nowhere near full capacity and inflation will remain subdued for some time to come. Uh, thank you and look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, uh, David. Well, thanks thanks to all our witnesses for, for being here today. And uh, we certainly hope that you and your families uh, continue to stay safe and healthy during this this pandemic. We appreciate you coming uh, forward today to talk about C14, but also the fall economic statement. And my, my first question will be to you, Mr. McDonald. Um, the fall economic statement, uh, when you look at the, the summary statement, uh, uh, foresees as of the next fiscal year, starting April 1st, so starting in two weeks, a dramatic reduction, cuts in program expenses. At the same time, we've had many witnesses uh, talking about the importance of continuing, particularly in light of the third wave, uh, continuing uh, supports and, in fact, expanding some of the uh, supports that uh, uh, to sectors that have, uh, have suffered the most during this pandemic. Yet, in the fall economic statement, uh, there was uh, really no effective um, initiative around revenue. And I'm addressing particularly the issue of the wealth tax. The CCPA did a, a study a couple of weeks ago, uh, which showed that the wealth tax uh, would be bringing in substantially uh, uh, more revenues than originally foreseen. And when we're looking at a, a scenario where Canada's billionaires have added over $60 billion uh, to their wealth through this pandemic. Uh, do you not believe that uh, the idea of uh, tackling that uh, massive inequality that we're seeing through, through such provisions as a wealth tax is not a, a good way for the government to respond to the crisis? Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Julian, for the for the question. Uh, I, I certainly think that there will be a time to to come in the in the next couple of years to start to examine new revenue measures. Um, and I think broadly, when we start to look at new revenue measures, uh, one of the things to to understand is that this uh, pandemic has not been bad for everyone. Um, financially, uh, there are certain firms and certain sectors that just happen to be on the right side of the pandemic and have made record profits as a result. Um, as, a, as a result of firms making record profits, CEOs will make record profits uh, attached to those firms. And even CEOs uh, working for companies uh, that did not make record profits will still likely see massive bonuses at the end of the year as the rules are changed such that uh, if the economy does really well, CEOs get massive bonuses. If the economy does badly, they change the rules so CEOs get massive bonuses in any event. Um, and then we come to the issue of, of wealth taxation. Um, again, uh, you know, for the highest decile of Canadians, this recession was over in July. Uh, job, uh, jobs had completely recovered for uh, people in the top quarter of earnings. Um, and for the top 1%, um, you know, asset values had increased based on stock market valuations as well as real estate valuations. 
And so this has not been bad for everyone. And so I think as a general principle, um, we should certainly be considering things uh, like, like a wealth tax, and Canada is the only uh, country in the G7 that doesn't have an inheritance tax. Um, every other major country does have an inheritance tax. A wealth tax would have to be built on lessons learned through inheritance taxes elsewhere. Uh, it's easy to make wealth taxes that are that are terrible in terms of their implementation. Um, but that isn't to say that uh, we shouldn't try um, to learn from lessons from other countries to build more effective wealth taxes. I think uh, other things that we might want to start considering uh, are things like a surplus profits tax, again, for the corporate uh, sector that has, uh, you know, sections of the corporate sector that has done very well from the pandemic, um, as well as potentially a new top uh, marginal tax rate, uh, sorry, a new mar top marginal tax rate uh, for individuals, again, uh, for people like CEOs uh, who will see record uh, you know, record bonuses out of this, um, and so I think I think it it is worth questioning who should who should in part contribute to the pandemic and the people who've done the best at the very high end of the income spectrum. I think should be asked to contribute some of what they've gained, uh, so that other people, particularly low income Canadians, um, are more likely to get support, and more likely to get a job. Uh, thank you for that. Now, when you appeared before this committee on June eighteenth, you said something very uh, press, uh, prescient. Uh, the protected nature of the Canadian banking sector has led to extraordinary profits to its shareholders and tremendous bonuses being paid to its executives. However, in a time of great need for many Canadians, it is time for more to be asked of the sector, not only for the good of Canadians, but also the good of our economy. Uh, now, uh, one, of the, one of the most uh, striking aspects of the government's response uh, on the pandemic was uh, the $750 billion, three quarters of a trillion dollars in liquidity supports given within days of the pandemic hitting. And uh, it appears that uh, nothing was really asked of the banking sector in return. So we've seen banking profits of over $40 billion so far during the pandemic. This is uh, through the, this government's policies. So I guess my question to you is this, do you feel that enough has been asked of the banking sector uh, in light of the unprecedented levels of liquidity supports uh, given to it. Thanks very much for the for the question. Uh, certainly, uh, the, there was actually a Financial Post story looking at uh, CEO bonuses at the big banks, despite the fact that revenues were off from last year, although they're still making profits. Uh, and in fact, you know, despite the fact that uh, that revenues were down in the banking sector. Um, CEO profits seem almost, or CEO benefits and their bonuses seem almost entirely unaffected. Uh, and so CEOs will continue receiving the same massive bonuses that they received in previous years, despite actual performance of the company. Um, and so this is a situation where, you know, if times are really good, CEOs get big bonuses. If times are bad, you change the rules, so CEOs get big bonuses. Uh, and I think we'll see the exact same thing this year. Um, and what, as we've seen, most of the proxy circulars already come out for uh, for the big banks. Uh, you know, one of my arguments that I was making in June um, was uh, was around the deferment of mortgages, which I, which which came as a result of, of federal government regulatory changes. I mean, it wasn't at the bank's behest that this happened, but rather because uh, the federal government changed the rules. Um, one of the reasons why household that has risen uh, from about 100% of GDP, where it stood for several years, um, up now to 110% uh, of GDP as of the latest data, is, be is in part because of those deferments. People took uh, banks up on those deferments and, and built up a bit of a, uh, a cash, uh, you know, a cash reserve so that they were better able to make their mortgage payments. Thankfully, we haven't as of yet seen uh, mass defaults as a result of the deferral programs ending. When it comes to asking more from banks, I think one of the things that the federal government could be asking of banks um, is a substantial reduction in uh, the cost for uh, homeowners to break particularly fixed rate mortgages. Um, those fees can be high, they can be uh, very unpredictable. Um, and given the support that the banking sector receives, and that CEOs continue to receive through bonuses, uh, I think it's fair to ask the banking sector to uh, to reduce the fees that they're charging people to break um, mortgages, particularly uh, fixed rate mortgages, um, in the hopes that if Canadians do continue to see sustained job loss and they can't make their mortgage payments, that at least um, in a high, you know, in in a uh, uh, high cost housing markets, they are able to sell their houses and get into something that they we can will. afford. We will have to end it there. 
And this next question is to anyone on the panel that wishes to uh, comment. Um, there's been a lot of commentary from uh, my opposition, our opposition colleagues, uh, that we have spent too much on these programs and that the supports we have implemented caused us to go into debt. Uh, we heard it again today in, in certain testimonies. Um, there are a few options to financing monumental programs like the ones created to help Canadians weather uh, this pandemic, either increase uh, Canada's annual debt, raise taxes on Canadian families and businesses, or cut funding to crucial programs. In your opinions, how should the federal government have financed this extra spending? during this time. Who wants to start? Uh, Mr. McDonald, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I certainly think that in, in the short run, those are exactly the three choices that governments face. They can raise taxes, they can cut programs, or they can run deficits or some mix of the three. Uh, you know, the decline in government, federal government revenues at $60 billion is so substantial that there'd really be no way for you to cut government programs to anywhere near balance the budget. And to do so would be devastating. I mean, you'd have to totally eliminate EI, totally eliminate, say, the Department of National Defense, and totally eliminate the Canada Child Benefit Program. I mean, that, that would have been sufficient to balance the books uh, in 2020. And so clearly deficit financing uh, is, the, is the right decision at, at this point. Uh, you know, the federal government interest rate on, on five to 10 year bonds is at or near historic lows. I mean, we haven't paid this little in interest rate on bonds going back to the 1950s, uh, where it, you know under under two percent is extremely low in terms of what we're paying to finance this debt. Um, very different, actually, from from the situation we, we faced in the 1990s, where interest rates were much much higher. And certainly, there is a risk that interest rates could rise and could increase costs at the federal government. But interest rates don't just affect the federal government. Interest rate rises affect the household and the corporate sector, in addition to the provincial sector, all of whom pay higher interest rates and all of whom are much more highly leveraged. I mean, the federal government's sitting at 50% of GDP right now in terms of its debt. The corporate sector is at 130% of GDP. The business, uh, the, the household sector is at 110% of GDP. Those sectors would be hit much harder. We'd be driven rapidly back into a recession uh, if we were to see a big increase in interest rates uh, before the federal government suffered in any real degree. Yeah, very question. quick question to David McDonald. I'm I, appearing before this committee some time ago now because it was former governor of the Bank of Canada, Stephen Polos, was asked about whether these policies could become inflationary. And I, crystal clarity, I'm sure many of you remember, he said, that's a problem I'd love to have. Uh, and he was much more worried about deflation. Uh, but David McDonald, would you comment? Well, you know, it, we're concerned about Canada's federal debt to GDP ratio at 50%. Uh, the Japanese debt to GDP ratio is at 260%, and they're desperate for more inflation. Uh, you know, they've, 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 been, they've been encountering deflation since a uh, real estate crash there in the 1990s. And so that is exactly a problem that we, that we should hope to have. Uh, certainly, higher inflation would give the Bank of Canada more flexibility, frankly. I mean, they're scraping along the zero lower bound. There's no way to increase economic growth anymore by lowering interest rates. They're already at zero. Um, and so, you know, higher inflation would give the Bank of Canada more flexibility to have slightly higher interest rates and potentially provide a bigger kick to the economy uh, in the next recession, which will inevitably happen. Okay, uh, thank you uh, all. Uh, thank you very much uh, to our witnesses uh, for appearance, uh, appearing. An, an hour goes by quickly. Usually.